with the first pick. Quarterback. 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 Why? 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 I want my number ones back, all of them. Few things in sports compare to a quarterback chosen first overall. The selection inspires fan bases to hope and dream. Then, reality hits. Your team isn't any good, probably won't be for a long while, and this guy is clearly set up for failure, right? This begs the question, why is it that NFL teams insist on drafting the most important position before any of the infrastructure for success exists? The answer is actually pretty simple, and the results of the picks may run contrary to what you think. Welcome back to Unlikely Success. Like, comment, and if you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe. Let's get into why NFL teams keep picking quarterbacks first overall, how this impacts the organization, and what the results have actually been, because they're quite surprising. We'll start with some high-level stats. 18 of 24 drafts have seen a quarterback selected first overall. 15 different franchises have chosen one. Three have been repeats. 13 of those quarterbacks made a Pro Bowl. One took home an MVP. Five played in a Super Bowl with six total appearances and half of those resulted in a championship. All of these numbers are better than I expected, and it's because I've always considered it to be foolish to draft a quarterback first overall unless one of two things is happening. A generational talent is available, or your franchise has been relatively stable and likely won't have a top five to 10 pick for years to come. Only a few of the 18 chosen could be considered generational, and a few of the teams could probably make a case that they didn't expect to be picking this high again. But to my surprise, the success rate is not bad at all. Success is a relative term, but for this conversation, I'm gonna define it as competent play over three years or more during a career. And by competent, I mean play capable of winning football games with pretty solid stats and dependable leadership. It'll be subjective, and I'm sure you're gonna let me know in the comments whether you agree or disagree with how I rate these guys. Oh, it's true. It's damn true. With that being said, Two of these QBs were definitive busts, with one of them being sacked so many times it ruined his career, and the other being completely uncommitted to football. Only one has an MVP, but nearly all of them have been stable, relatively competent, and quite a few have been the best in their class by a very wide margin. Honestly, it's pretty crazy how well they've performed given the situations that most of them entered into. All of these stats help explain why GMs keep taking a quarterback first when given the chance. First round quarterback hit rates are estimated to be 46%, which is much lower than the 12 out of 16, or 75% that we're about to walk through on this list. I'm intentionally excluding the last two selections 12 out of 16, as it's really unfair to consider them a success or a bust. And I gave a few the benefit of the doubt based on what we've seen so far. Now that we have some of the high level stats out of the way, we can talk about how this impacts an organization. From a team perspective, doubling the chance that your quarterback will be a solid option is enough to make any front office smitten. Couple that with the boost in owner and fan excitement, now it's a no brainer. If this wasn't enough, in 2011, the rookie pay scale was established and having a quarterback on a rookie deal became an NFL salary cheat code. Teams are getting constructed every year to take advantage of this. If you can get a franchise quarterback and you get him for yeah. that rookie uh, salary and contract, then you can build around him. Brock Purdy is getting paid peanuts and this allows the 49ers to distribute resources across the roster. Russell Wilson's rookie deal was a large factor in the Seahawks' ability to build a great defense. I know what you may be thinking. Both these examples are later round picks that worked out for those teams, but it's limited to this type of situation. That's not true though. Joe Burrow turned around the Bengals in two years. Baker Mayfield found a way to lead the Browns to the playoffs. Cam Newton took Carolina to a Super Bowl appearance, and those are just the guys that overcame poorly run franchises while still on their rookie scale contracts. Eli Manning may have turned away the Chargers, but he found a way to turn this into a pair of Super Bowls with the Giants. What I'm trying to say here is, if you could guarantee a 30% greater success rate at nearly anything in life, you take it. This guy knows what I'm talking about. Now we're ready to move into the selections and their performance. We're going to start with what I believe is the most talented quarterback ever drafted, Mike Vick. He was a game-changing athlete out of Virginia Tech, where the hype was massive. As he entered the NFL, he had posted the fastest 40-yard dash ever for a quarterback. He had a cannon for an arm, and he was a true unicorn at the position. The San Diego Chargers had traded the rights to the Falcons for the first overall pick, 
and Michael Vick would become the face of Atlanta football. He would see limited time his rookie year as he developed under incumbent starter Chris Chandler, but the Falcons had a clear plan for Vick. Over his six years in Atlanta, he would post a 38-28-1 record, throw for 11,500 yards, rush for 4,000 more, account for 92 touchdowns, get selected to three Pro Bowls, and be the first road quarterback to beat the Green Bay Packers in Lambeau. He became an absolute icon. That is, until, shockingly, prior to the 2007 season, Vic would run into legal issues surrounding a dogfighting investigation that would land him in prison. After serving his time, being released by Atlanta, and paying back $20 million in a signing bonus, the Philadelphia Eagles would sign Michael Vick. At the time, Andy Reid was the head coach and firmly believed the talented quarterback deserved a second chance. It was a one-year team deal with an option for year two essentially a low-risk, high-reward deal that allowed for him to prove he was rededicated to the NFL. 2009 was the first year of this deal, and he would start only one game throwing for 86 yards. It was disappointing, but greater things were on the horizon. Prior to the 2010 season opener, Eagles longtime starting quarterback Donovan McNabb would be traded. After an injury to Kevin Cobb, Vic would get exactly the opportunity he had been hoping for. He would go 8-3 and in 11 starts, throw for over 3,000 yards for the first time, have the most passing touchdowns of his career, and win the NFL Comeback Player of the Year award. It seemed like a match made in heaven, and he was rewarded for his play with a six-year, $100 million deal with $40 million in guaranteed money. In 2011, he would post a 7-6 and record with a career-high 3,300 passing yards, but the season was an overall step back for the team. The next year would mark an end of an era in Philadelphia, as the team would go 4-12 and and Andy Reid was fired. Vic regressed in every passing metric, and prior to 2013, his deal was restructured. He would make 12 more starts from 2013 to 2015 and play for three different clubs. Some may classify Vic's career as a disappointment, but with a 61-51-1 regular season record, over 22,000 passing yards, 6,100 rushing yards, and the cultural impact of his career, I can't help but call him a success on the field. I don't condone his actions, and I believe he could have been far greater if it were not for his decisions, but he paid the price for them and he still found a way back to high-level play. He was not the best quarterback in his draft, though, as that right belongs to Drew Brees. Coincidentally, one of the picks traded for Vic. But you let me know what you think. Was Michael Vick a legend or a disappointment in your eyes? I'm not bitter because I think it changed me and helped me become a better person, and now I'm doing better things with my life. Like, I actually enjoy working with the Humane Society. It's, it's been a pleasure, and everybody thinks I'm doing it as a gimmick, but I'm really not. Um, you know, the only thing that would change is, you know, the fact that I fought those dogs and, you know, I could have gave them a better life. Our second name on the list was the first ever selection by the Houston Texans, David Carr. This meant two things. His name would be part of NFL history books, and he'd be forced to grow up with an inexperienced organization. David was coming off a stellar season at Fresno State, which landed him in the Heisman race and vaulted him to the top of the draft. Carr would suffer a bad rookie season, posting a 4-12 record, throwing for nearly 2,600 yards, 9 touchdowns, 15 picks, but he also set an unenviable record of being sacked more than any quarterback in NFL history, 76 times. In my opinion, those sacks changed his career forever. Over the next four seasons, he would not post a winning record, throw for 50 touchdowns and 50 interceptions, and develop some seriously bad habits. After the 2006 season, which happened to be a career year for Carr, he would leave Houston for the Panthers. He would start four more games in five seasons, and he has become a clear what-if story. He was a victim of bad circumstances and joined a team nowhere near ready to win. His time as a pro was a financial success, but it was not what the Texans or David thought it would be on the field. Even with all this being said, Carr is still clearly the best quarterback from his draft class. Do you think if you had gone later in the draft, but maybe to a better team, that maybe you would have had a better career instead of getting sacked 65 times every year? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I mean, I, I think about that all the time. So I remember even being in Pittsburgh uh, playing in a preseason game, and here comes Ben Roethlisberger picked in the middle of the first round. And I'm like, this is all they need. They just need a quarterback. They, they got a great football team. Yeah. And there's, there's situations like that all over the place. You, know, you see where Aaron Rodgers lands. He sits there for a while and he's got to be, you know, he's got to be on TV and be in that awkward green room moment where, oh man, they haven't taken He lands in a perfect place with the Hall of Fame quarterback to kind of show him the ropes, even though it was a little rocky at the beginning. He got to 
he got to jump right in there. So, oh, there's no doubt, man. I mean, it's he's Tom Coughlin used to always tell me, only goes the guys around you, and this is this is a team for a reason. The third name on this list is going to be a familiar one, Carson Palmer. His name was also part of our Heisman Curse video and covered quickly there. After winning the Heisman Trophy at USC, Palmer would become part of the Cincinnati Bengals. At the time, the Bengals were known for being poorly run, and their new QB was being tasked with turning the franchise around. He would sit his rookie year, developing under John Kitna, but he could not be denied in year two. He would lead Cincy to two playoff appearances over seven seasons, one of which was very promising until an injury to Palmer derailed it. He threw for 154 touchdowns in his time with the team, but his exit was tense. He may have even lied just to leave the team. After a standoff with Bengal management, Carson got his wish as he was traded to the Oakland Raiders. But as the saying goes, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. His time in Oakland was a disaster. The QB looked washed as he led the team to an 8 and 16 record and was clearly not worth the first and second round picks they traded for him. It was obvious that a move was best for Oakland and Palmer, and he would find a new home with the Arizona Cardinals. Palmer was quoted as he left saying, I've got a lot of tread left on my tires. And it turns out he was right. He was paired up with new head coach Bruce Arians and together they rebuilt the mid 30 year olds career. Over the next three seasons, Arizona would go 29 and nine at Palmer starts. He'd throw for 70 touchdowns, finished second in MVP and made the NFC championship where they would lose to the Carolina Panthers. Carson would go on to play two more years with Arizona but the team never got close to their 2015 NFC Championship appearance. For his career, he was 92, 88 and one, with 294 touchdowns and 187 picks. He had a one and three playoff record, two top five MVP finishes, and currently he sits 15th in passing yards and touchdowns. His career lived up to the hype, even if he didn't win an MVP or Super Bowl. Carson was also clearly the best quarterback drafted, but there was one undrafted guy who happened to play for Dallas that challenged him, Tony Romo. For my money, Carson wins out as the best QB of his draft class. What about you? Did Palmer live up to the hype, or did he complain his way out of several situations in your eyes? I never understood why you wanted to be in Cincinnati. I never understood it, but I'm a fan. He said what? Why I wanted to be in Cincinnati? In Cincinnati. Playing for the Bengals is what I'm trying to say. Now, I'm not saying you want to be there, but I'm just saying playing for the Bengals. You don't have a choice when you get drafted. That's it's true. It's different if you're First coming out in, in high school and you get to you get recruited. I, 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 well, you do have a choice to some degree. You could have pulled a John Elway. You know what true. I'm saying? You could have done that. Right. True. I might have wanted to with the Bengals, but that's just me. 2004's first overall pick is NFL royalty, Eli Manning. The Manning family would create a controversy around Eli as they made it clear that there was no intention of joining the San Diego Chargers who held the first overall pick. Archie, Eli's father, publicly stated such. Leading up to the 2004 draft, it was a game of chicken and the Chargers blinked. They would trade the first overall pick after they selected Manning for Phillip Rivers, a 2004 third rounder, and a 2005 first and fifth round pick. Eli would go on to play 16 years for the Giants, make the Pro Bowl four times, the playoffs six times, and had won two Super Bowls against Tom Brady and the Pats. Interestingly, out of his six postseason runs, the only two where he won a playoff game resulted in rings. Eli's record sits at a perfect 117 and 117 if you know his career. He is top 10 in passing yards and passing touchdowns, and it feels like a fringe Hall of Fame quarterback. The younger Manning had nowhere near the impact of his older brother, but he was a solid quarterback for over a decade with two great playoff runs. When we consider the 2004 draft class though, it's really hard to call Eli the best quarterback. Rivers was a better regular season performer, but he lacks any postseason success. And Big Ben has Super Bowl rings to go along with his stats. From my vantage point, Big Ben gets the nod all day. But what do you think? Was Big Ben the best? Philip Rivers or Eli? And do you think that Philip Rivers could have had the same success, maybe even better, with the Giants? I agree with you, Greeny. Eli Manning should get into the Hall of Fame. I also believe that Eli Manning will get into the Hall of Fame. I also don't believe he was a very good quarterback. I'm not going to sit here and knock Eli Manning or knock other people who are in the Hall of Fame because I will not be. When I look at Eli Manning, when you have to say about a quarterback, this quarterback 
wasn't game plan for. You heard Bill Belichick saying, make him throw it to Mario Manningham. There has never been a time in the world where you're playing against Aaron Rodgers and you say, make Aaron Rodgers throw it to anybody. You say, we got to find a way to get it out of his hands. There's never been a time in the world where you're playing Tom Brady and you want him to be the person making the decision, the action, and the play that is going to decide the game. Never in life have I ever played Eli Manning and had a coach come into a meeting and I played with Dick LeBeau. Never did he come in and say, guys, we got to strap it in this week because even if we do everything right, Eli Manning might beat you. Who are you talking to right now? Who is it you think you see? You clearly don't know who you're talking to, so let me clue you in. I am the one who knocks. In 2005, we saw a great fall related to one very talented quarterback and a great shadow cast over the other. Alex Smith was selected first overall by the San Francisco 49ers, and Aaron Rodgers landed with the Green Bay Packers after sliding to 24th. Smith would have a career marred by injuries, and he was replaced by younger options at two different stops. But it was a solid career. Was it a first pick overall career? Probably not. But he did develop into a solid starter in San Fran before they moved on to Colin Kaepernick, who was a younger option with a higher upside but a significantly lower floor. Smith would be traded to Kansas City for a high second round pick where he was groomed by what I would call the best coach ever for quarterbacks, Andy Reid. Over five seasons in KC, he would make the playoffs four times, secure a Pro Bowl selection three times, and post a 50 and 26 regular season record. He had become a solid NFL starter, but sometimes patterns reemerge in life and the NFL. Kansas City would select Patrick Mahomes in 2017, which just so happens to coincide with what would become Smith's last season for the club. Even as he posted career highs in passing yards and touchdowns, he could not hold off what was inevitable. Alex would again be traded, this time to Washington for a third round pick and a corner. Upon arrival, he would be given a contract extension and things appeared promising as the team went six and four in his starts, but a gruesome leg injury would alter Smith's career forever. He would miss the entirety of 2019 and nearly died based on reports. In 2020, he would miraculously start six games. He would go five and one, but it was clear he was not meant to play much longer. After the season, he would retire. He is clearly not the best quarterback in his class, as Rodgers is, but Smith played at a pretty high level for half his 14 seasons and made the postseason five times. He was no slouch and can be called an NFL success based on longevity, development, willingness to play his role, and ability to lead winning teams. He also made nearly $200 million. So if that's a failure, sign me up. Alex Smith has been playing MVP football so well. This was the year they beat the dog shit out of the Patriots opening week or whatever. The, th the fact that that team was going so good and Alex Smith was playing so well, it led to the point that they could rest their starters in the last week against the Denver Broncos. Patrick Mahomes goes on there, dominates that offseason. They go in a playoff run, they lose that offseason. Alex Smith is getting sent to Washington. We're going Patrick Mahomes. I was like, are you, are you kidding? Alex Smith is playing the best football he has ever ever played in his entire career. He was absolutely dominant in that Andy Reid offense. They were balling. This is dumb. And then that's like, well, just wait until you see what we got back here. I got some text messages from some chiefs that I know, and they're like, wait till you see this dude. Wait till you see this dude. I'm like, yeah, just cut an MVP so get the fuck out of here. I assume he's pretty good. 2007 would see the Raiders take a big, physically gifted quarterback from LSU, Jamarcus Russell. We've all heard of him, and we all know he was a bust. Back in 2007, though, he was seen as an extremely talented prospect with concerns about his work ethic. Russell would hold out all of training camp and the first week of the season to get a proper contract, after which he showed up out of shape and poorly conditioned. Once he joined the team, head coach Lane Kiffin would openly discuss a desire to bring him along slowly, but this may have been to cover for his conditioning issues. Bring him along slowly he did though, as Russell would only start one game and appear in four. At the end of the season, Kiffin would announce that Russell was going to be the 2008 starter. He would repay his head coach by showing up for camp out of shape for a second time. Kiffin would be fired only a few weeks into the year in a very public way, and it later came out that the former Raiders head coach and the owner were at odds and statements would confirm that Lane was always against drafting Jamarcus in the first place. Russell would post a 5-10 record, throw for 2,400 yards, 13 touchdowns, and 8 picks, with 6 of those touchdowns coming in the final 2 weeks of the season. It's safe to say the team was underwhelmed. In 2009, after again showing up out of shape to camp, he would disappoint the team even further. 
He would start nine games, going two and seven, throwing for 1,300 yards, three touchdowns and 11 picks, but it was a clear regression. By the end of the season, he had been benched, would be released, and never given another chance with an organization. I'm definitely not going to say that Russell was the best quarterback in his class, but there also really isn't another option. Whenever that dreaded word bust comes up, you're a part of it. Do you consider yourself the biggest bust in NFL draft history? When you look at it that way, I say I must have been the best to be the biggest. Right. I'll say my shit didn't turn out how I wanted it to or not how they expected it to, you know, but if you're going to call me a bust, like you say, put the biggest on that mother, man. Yes! That's awesome! 2009 had a signal caller separate himself pretty early on, and that was Matthew Stafford. He would join the Detroit Lions, who already had all-world wide receiver Megatron, and the franchise felt like it was on the rise. Stafford would become the first rookie quarterback in 40 years to start for the Lions in week one. He would miss six games as a rookie and another 13 in his second season. Nearly all of these games were due to a separated shoulder, and it caused concern about his ability to stay healthy. Fortunately for Detroit, it would be another eight seasons before he'd miss another game. Unfortunately for Detroit, over his 12 years with the club, they would only make the playoffs three times and win none of those games. Stafford gained a reputation as a stat padding quarterback who was not a winner. The Lions had a long history of losing and had two all-time great players retire early rather than continue playing in Detroit, one of which happened during Stafford's career. And Stafford seemed to be walking down a similar path. His 45,000 passing yards and 282 touchdowns were not enough to support a winning record as he was 74, 90, and 1 over 12 years. After what can only be called a remarkably classy career with an organization, Matthew would request a trade and it felt as though it was time to move on for both sides. Shortly after he requested the trade, he'd be shipped to LA in exchange for a haul of draft picks and their starting quarterback, Jared Goff. More to come on him later. Just in case you haven't caught it in any of my other videos, I am a Rams fan, and I can say that the Stafford trade was well worth it. He would immediately lift the Rams to a Super Bowl win in 2021, and this put to bed any of the ridiculous takes that he was unable to win in the playoffs. If Matthew had retired after, I would have considered him a Rams legend, even if it was only that season. Instead, he suffered through a nightmarish 2022 where many openly considered him washed. But 2023 proved he still got it, as he played some of his best ball ever. Over Stafford's time in the NFL, he has amassed over 56,000 passing yards, 357 touchdowns, both of these are just outside the top 10 all time, one comeback player of the year, two Pro Bowl selections, but he has no All-Pro teams and only one season in the MVP discussion. With all of this being said, he won a Super Bowl, changed the narrative around his career, and he's proved he's a winner. His passing numbers speak for themselves, and he was definitely the best quarterback in his draft class. What do you think? Is Matthew Stafford a Hall of Fame quarterback? I mean, I think he is, but as I said before, I'm definitely biased. Matthew Stafford has, is not an MVP caliber player. He's a good quarterback. He's not a great one, but he's a good one. <laughs> 2010's first overall pick was Sam Bradford. He's another of a few in this video that were part of our Heisman Curse video. Sam Bradford was probably better than you think in the NFL. And as I previously mentioned, he is a player who I thought would help turn around the St. Louis Rams at the time. He wasn't, but that was not due to his lack of ability. After winning Rookie of the Year, he would suffer an ankle injury that bothered him quite a bit during his second season, and he would go 1-9 on an awful Rams team that finished 2-14. Bradford would be discussed in the offseason as a potential trade asset, given the Rams held the second pick, but instead the team would opt to accept a substantial trade package from Washington. 2012 would go on to be a career year for Sam in both yards and touchdowns. It showed impressive development. Unfortunately, he would be injured in week 7 of the 2013 season and traded before the Rams could surround him with enough talent to win. Bradford would go on to play for the Eagles, Vikings, and Cardinals, and he showed promise with two of them. His career is consistently talked about by leading with his injury history, but every full season he played resulted in over 3,500 passing yards, 
and an average of 19 touchdowns. He was traded twice for decent draft packages, and he even signed a one-year, $20 million deal with the Cardinals in what became his last season. He only played one season with an elite set of wide receivers, and that was probably the best year of his career. I cannot call Bradford a success on this list, but I refuse to call him a bust. He also can be considered the best quarterback from his draft class, so there's that. He's too good to give up on, and he was so good that three teams have given up a lot for him. And, and, and it's, it's really bad. He gets a bad rap. He's got a bum knee, but he really does get a bum rap. He started 15 games last year, 14 the year before. He started 16 twice in his career. So this idea of Sam Bradford being fragile or being soft is really an overstatement. I guess I just reject this idea that he's just a star cross guy, underachiever. He's extremely accurate, set an all-time record, checking it down, pushing it down in week one against the Saints, albeit. He's a better player than his reputation would lead well, to Well, he's, he's a better player than the numbers show, but if he's not available... 2011's first overall pick was not as certain. Scouts were not in agreement that Cam Newton was clearly the best choice, but the Carolina Panthers would choose him anyway. As we previously covered in the Heisman Curse video, Cam was a successful pick. He would win Offensive Rookie of the Year, lead a 12-4 team in his third season, and build toward a Super Bowl run in his fifth. Cam was an okay passer, but he really excelled with his running ability and general physicality. He was an incredible athlete who played quarterback, but he never developed into a traditional QB. Over his 10 years with Carolina, Newton won an MVP, posted four winning records, threw for just under 30,000 yards, 186 touchdowns, and had a shade under 60% completions. He was also a prolific running quarterback with over 5,000 rushing yards and 72 touchdowns. His playing style was the predecessor to Josh Allen, but he wasn't quite as good in the passing game. The Panthers reached the pinnacle of football, but he could not close the deal. And the Super Bowl appearance damaged Cam's reputation a bit, as a scramble for a fumble appeared to show him giving less than full effort. Still, he is the best quarterback in his class by a pretty good margin, and he played at a very high level in the NFL. He is one of the best athletes to ever play his position, and it's hard to say that his career wasn't a success. Do you know that his rookie year, he completed 60% of his passes? And the next six or seven years, he never completed 60% of his passes. I'm looking at it from the standpoint that I understand. You're Ron Rivera. You're the Carolina Panthers. Your defense is usually stout. And you rely a lot on Cam Newton. But Cam Newton wants it that way. Cam Newton was the one that was fighting them when they were telling him they didn't want to run as much anymore because they wanted to protect him from himself. And he was fighting them, talking about, don't take the cape off Superman. Let me be me. Let me do my thing. I'm just looking at him from the standpoint, we talk about Cam like he has arrived. You're in the NFC South. You're a former league MVP. I know the talent is big time overall athletically, but when I think about the AFC South and I think about quarterbacks, obviously I think about Drew Brees and Matt Ryan before I think about Cam Newton. Let's just say I know a guy who knows a guy who knows another guy. In 2012, the top quarterback was considered can't miss. He was often compared to his predecessor in Indianapolis, and for good reason. When the Colts selected Andrew Luck, he made them relevant all over again. The team would go 11-5 and in his rookie year, and he would just miss out on beating RG3 for the offensive rookie of the year. Luck had a style that reminded me of John Elway. He was a tremendous pocket passer, but he also had the ability to run. His running style was aggressive and physical and it added an element to his game that kept defenses on their heels. Luck would lead three straight playoff teams to start his career, one of which ended in the AFC Championship game as part of the infamous Deflategate scandal. But with the score being 45-7, I'm not sure the inflation of those footballs played any part at all in that loss. He would miss parts of the 2015 season with a shoulder injury, lacerated kidney, and a torn ab muscle, but few saw what these injuries may have actually been foreshadowing. 2016 would see a new contract, but a down year for Indy. Luck played well, but the team barely stayed above 500 in his starts. He would have off-season surgery on his shoulder, and this set off a pretty crazy series of events. Andrew would miss the entirety of the 2017 season before returning in 2018, where he appeared fully recovered and nearly set personal best in passing yards and touchdowns. In a shocking turn of events, Luck would retire prior to the 2019 season, citing his cycle of injuries and his desire to live life on his own terms. It's a career that feels like a what if, but over six seasons, he had five winning records, nearly 24,000 passing yards, 171 touchdowns, and four Pro Bowls. He quickly became one of the NFL's best before he decided to 
to end his career so abruptly. His draft class has one of the biggest what-ifs with RG3, but Luck is not that far off. Luck's career is not the best in his class, but it had the makings of becoming it. Russell Wilson has the mantle from this class, but I've always wondered, could Luck or RG3 have been one of the all-time greats? Do you think that Luck would have been able to challenge Brady or Mahomes, or would he have been stuck losing to those guys over his entire career? In the last couple of seasons, the franchise has gone backward, and it seems his play has to for people who aren't paying attention. But I've been paying attention to Andrew Luck. This is a guy without a line, without a running game, and without a defense. And just because he's on your team, you're a threat to make the playoffs. Jameis Winston was a debated first overall pick in 2015, being compared directly to Marcus Mariota and winning out to become the Tampa Bay Bucks selection. He was also part of our Heisman Curse video. Winston's college career had been shrouded in controversy, but his on-field play led to an inability to pass on him in the draft. Winston would be what I would call a good stat, bad team type of guy in Tampa Bay. He led one team to a winning record, posted impressive yardage totals, but turned the ball over all the time. Over his first four seasons, he wasn't quite developing as the Bucks had hoped, culminating in a 5,100-yard, 30-touchdown, 30-interception season that led to him being replaced by Tom Brady. The team would win a Super Bowl after he left, while Jameis became a backup in New Orleans. In 2021, he was given a chance to be the Saints starter, and he honestly played pretty well, but an injury that tore the primary ligaments in his knee would derail this comeback. He's only started three games the last two seasons, and after defying his coaches at the end of his tenure with the Saints, it's not likely he will ever be a franchise quarterback for any team in the future. For his career, he has a 34-46 record, over 22,000 passing yards, 141 touchdowns, and a Pro Bowl appearance. It wasn't a great draft class, and Winston may be the best in this class, but similar to 2007, I'm not gonna pick anyone. What do you think of Jameis? Was he overrated or never given a fair chance in Tampa? You watch Jameis in college, he, he was carefree with the ball. That interception yesterday against Seattle was as bad an interception at the most critical time of a game that you're gonna see. And to me, that just is always has been the case with Jameis. He throws the ball, and I, and I want quarterbacks who are gonna take some chances, mm -hmm. but I don't want one who's gonna take dumb chances. 2016 was the second time in less than a decade the Rams make our list, choosing Jared Goff. The pick would start an F them picks mantra from the team's management and kickstart the ascension of the organization. Goff would have a rough rookie year, but there was a coaching change that would alter his trajectory. Enter new head coach Sean McVay, the youngest in NFL history, and a game changer for the recently relocated Rams. The now LA Rams, led by Jared Goff, would go 42 and 20 over the next four seasons and appear in a Super Bowl, but it was not as rosy as the record may seem. Jared was seen as a byproduct of McVay's genius. He was often cited as needing his head coach to decode defense and dictate what play to run, rather than the quarterback having control of the offense. He would average over 4,000 passing yards and nearly 25 touchdowns a season, but the first two with McVay were better than the last two. And by the end of the 2020 season, a divorce was inevitable. Goff would be part of the trade mentioned earlier on the list for Matthew Stafford. As Jared went to Detroit, he was seen as a throw-in that the Rams wanted to offload, but from the Lions' perspective, this was not the case. In three seasons, he has led the hopeless Lions to not only their first playoff win in over 30 years, but a second and nearly a Super Bowl bid. For his career, he has thrown for over 30,000 yards, 185 touchdowns, made three Pro Bowls, and posted winning records in six of eight seasons. His playoff record has been solid at four and four, but similar to Alex Smith mentioned earlier, Goff will never be seen as elite at his position. He carries a stigma of being a game manager, but I would contend this is no longer fair. Like it or not, there's a good chance Jared ends up in the Hall of Fame, especially if he keeps on his current career track for another three to four years. He's been the leader of two different quality teams. It may not look how you want it, but he's an effective quarterback. It's a very close conversation between Goff and Dak for the best of this class, and the homer pick in me goes with Jared. Is Goff a quality quarterback in your eyes, or is he the product of great coaching and situations? Through six games this season, he is one of two quarterbacks ranked in the top five for passing yards, completion percentage, touchdowns, passer rating. The other one is Tua Tonga Bailoa, who, according to DraftKings, is the favorite for the MVP, followed by Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Brock Purdy. Why aren't you in the top five? Look at me, son. It's not your fault. 2018 had an exciting quarterback draft class on paper. Baker Mayfield would be selected by the Cleveland Browns first overall, 
over Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, and Lamar Jackson. Mayfield had been a controversial figure at Oklahoma, but his talent was undeniable. He had a confident leadership style and brash persona, but he won in college and he posted some impressive stats. Over the three seasons prior to Baker arriving, the Browns had won four total games, and they were a complete laughingstock. Baker would lead the team to six in his rookie season and help turn things around. He would even be the quarterback of the team's first playoff win in 18 years, but after injuries derailed his fourth season, Cleveland shook things up by trading for Deshaun Watson. It's a move they probably regret after the way the last few seasons have played out, but Baker would go on quite a journey of his own during that time. He was traded to the Panthers by the Browns, cut by Carolina during the season, picked up by the Rams, and landed on a cheap deal with the Bucks in 2023. In Tampa, he would lead an improbable playoff appearance, earn a new contract, and completely change the narrative around him. Mayfield has a full video on the channel and was part of the Heisman Curse video if you want more coverage on him. For his career, he's 40-46 and 46 with a 2-2 two two playoff record. He's thrown for over 20,000 yards, 130 touchdowns, and proven himself as a capable leader. He's definitely not the best quarterback in his class, but Lamar and Josh are both special talents. I want to call Baker a success, and I think, relatively speaking, he is. But having two other quarterbacks outperform him and a losing record is strong evidence against it. Uh, you know what? What the hell? I'm still calling him a success. I mean, it's my list after all. I'm not saying Baker Mayfield's going to be Brett Favre because Brett Favre was really good. I don't think Baker is that gifted. I, I just don't. He's going to be really good, but is he a Hall of Famer? I don't know. I'm stopping short of that. 2019 would make it back-to-back -back number one picks for the University of Oklahoma, as the Arizona Cardinals selected Kyler Murray. Murray was a baseball star who played football, but he became a football star. He had already signed a contract to play Major League Baseball with the Oakland A's, but decided to pursue football instead. The year before, Arizona had taken Josh Rosen, but they jettisoned him quickly in favor of Kyler. It was the right choice, but the jury is still out on whether Murray can actually lead the Cardinals to becoming a viable Super Bowl contender. There's also an odd clause the team pushed for being put in his contract that required him to study the playbook more often. Apparently, he has an affinity for modern warfare. He has one winning season in his first five, but he has played at a high level when he's healthy, earning two Pro Bowl nods, winning the Offensive Rookie of the Year, and throwing for 15,647 yards and 94 touchdowns. He is still in his mid-20s, and with the team adding Marvin Harrison Jr. this year, there's real hype about this offense. He was part of another below average draft class for quarterbacks, but he's clearly the best to come out of it so far. Let me know what you think. Do you consider Kyler Murray a success or does he still have to show more on the field? I like a lot of things about Kyler Murray. I thought that in his first game, he did some of the things that I saw in college that I really liked. And, and, and the, specifically, he's got a lot of poise in the pocket. So a lot of running quarterbacks, their answer is with their feet. So when they feel a little bit of heat, they always go to their feet as the first answer. Kyler has great poise in the pocket. He's willing to let things unfold, go to the second read. To me, that that part I really like about him. What I, don't you like? I like the fact that, well, there's a difference between I like something about a guy and he's a generational talent. <laughs> so what what is a generational talent anyways? Is that once every 10 years, once every 12 years? And what is Tom Brady then? Is he uh, like a, like what generation does he apply to? Millennial talent. It, right? it, you know, so... Yeah, they, so th there are things that he did really positively in this first game, but to give anybody that moniker right off the bat, I think, I, I also think it's unfair to the player. This is bad. This is bad. 2020 had a pretty good top end group of quarterbacks, but one of them stood out from the others. And this was based on an amazing LSU season in his senior year. The Bengals would choose Joe Burrow first overall, even as the Dolphins were rumored to want the pick. They resisted, and they got their guy. Cincinnati would see promise in his rookie year until a knee injury sidelined him. He would come back with a vengeance in year two, leading the Bengals to the Super Bowl and winning comeback player of the year. His third season would be equally as impressive, but it would end with a narrow loss to the eventual Super Bowl winning champion, Kansas City Chiefs. Year if healthy, he has the ability to be an all-time great, but his durability makes you wonder, will he ever reach this full potential? Over four seasons, he's won Comeback Player of the Year, made the Pro Bowl and Super Bowl, and thrown for 14,000 yards and 97 touchdowns. The only thing stopping Joe has been injuries, because on the field, he's lived up to expectations. I'm going to label him a success, but I reserve the right to change that if injuries shoot down his star. What I've seen from this guy 
since coming off the campus at LSU in his final year at LSU and what he is doing for the Cincinnati Bengals needs to be commented upon. What he has become and what he is is a stone cold quarterback assassin. Entering the 2021 draft, there was what many considered a generational talent and the Jaguars chose him first overall. His name, Trevor Lawrence. He was a media darling starting with his freshman year at Clemson, and while he never won the Heisman and looked a little bit like sunshine from Remember the Titans, one thing was for certain, he could play. Jacksonville would inadvertently thrust him into one of the weirdest rookie seasons ever, and he handled it pretty well, all things considered. He has been developing at a decent pace when you take into account how bad the first year was. Critics may point to the Jag step back in 2023, but Lawrence's stats were pretty similar to the prior year, and his record was essentially identical. He hasn't quite lived up to the generational billing, but he has been pretty good so far. Maybe I'm giving him more credit than he deserves for how he handled that rookie year with Urban, but you know what? In the comments, let me know if I'm wrong. Over three years, he has nearly 12,000 passing yards, 58 touchdowns, and he made a Pro Bowl. He might not be the prince that was promised, but he's definitely an above average QB. He's also the best quarterback from his class already, and that's not likely to change in the coming years. There is one mega town generational talent in this draft, Trevor Lawrence. Bryce Young was a star at Alabama. He played on a stacked team and he excelled, but the question surrounding him in the NFL was, and still is, his size. Young is short and slight by quarterback standards, and it shows on the field. He was selected first overall, one spot ahead of CJ Stroud, and it looked like a mistake in their rookie seasons. I would love to say that I think it'll turn around, but I'm not really sure that's true. Carolina has a lack of infrastructure currently, and it will likely take the remainder of Young's rookie contract to rebuild. By that time, he could already be seen as damaged goods. Only time will tell if he can turn things around. Big story with Bryce Young being benched. I feel bad for him. Not every number one pick, not every first round pick at that position should start. Bryce Young, I, he just seemed overwhelmed by it. If I'm playing at Alabama and I've got the offensive line, I got a Hall of Fame coach, I got a running back, I got wide receivers who are first round pick, it's pretty easy. It's not easy in Carolina. Although I've been told their offensive line is a lot better than I'm giving them credit for. They don't have playmakers there. And the first thing that goes with these quarterbacks is your confidence. And then you get into bad habits. And then all of a sudden you want the ball out of your hands. You don't want to be running for your life. I've said it since he was being drafted. I don't know if he can play. I saw him at Alabama and he looked great. But there are a lot of people who look great in college. And I don't know if Carolina really put him out there in a position to succeed. The latest addition to first overall picks is Caleb Williams. After a strong college career, he is joining one of the best situations we've seen probably since Andrew Luck. The Chicago Bears traded their pick from the prior year and landed the first overall pick, thanks to the Carolina Panthers. They have a legitimate number one wide receiver, added Keenan Allen, who's closer than you might think to a Hall of Fame career, and used their top 10 pick to add an excellent prospect in Roma Dunze. Williams has talent around him, and he's likely going to join the successes mentioned earlier on this list. But for now, no judgment can be rendered. What are you seeing out of Caleb's first month in the NFL? A couple weeks ago, you know, he makes the first guy miss, the second guy miss, and then the third guy gets him. Or he gets hit while he's throwing and it's a pick. Um, you know, quarterbacks that who rely on that, or that's a strength of theirs, because I don't think it's not, uh, who can make people miss in the pocket and buy time. Uh, players who grew up doing that in high school, Caleb Williams was nobody on the field to tackle, right? And then I would argue at SC, no one on the field could tackle him. And so he's created success and created a history of part, big part of his game is creating time and space by moving around in the pocket and using his athleticism. Well, I can't put a quarterback through drills to tell them, hey, you're gonna have to speed that up in the league. And we can't practice that in practice. You can only get those reps in the game because that's the only time they're actually coming after you, diving at you, trying to hit you. And so I just think guys like that it's going to take him a little bit to figure out what he can and can't get away with. 
overall, franchises are probably right about taking the best available quarterback when you have the first overall pick and don't have a franchise guy in place. Even if the team is weak around them, getting the best guy in a given year's draft does more than just provide hope for fans and impress your owner. It turns into a relatively good success rate that he'll at least work out for a few years. Could you make the case that some of these guys became successful because the investment of the organization was too great? Yes. You could also make the case that some of these quarterbacks found a way to become stable in the NFL, despite coming into some of the worst setups for them to succeed. I originally thought teams were incorrect building by taking a quarterback first overall, but maybe I was the one who was incorrect. This has been the unlikely success. Whenever you're in the conversation for the number one pick, it's obviously a dream come true. 